So we're going to continue in our series called Out of Egypt, and we're actually going to pick up exactly where we left off uh, last week. Last week we left off in Exodus chapter 2, so if you have your Bible, you can open up there. And last week we left off after Moses had been uh, drawn from the water. He began to uh, be raised in Pharaoh's house by Pharaoh's daughter. And uh, so we're going to pick up verse 11. So it says that one day when Moses had grown up, he went out to his people and he looked on their burdens. And he saw an Egyptian that was beating a Hebrew one of his people. And so, uh, you know, whether uh, Moses was told by his mom when she was nursing him and as a young child and, and everything that he was a Hebrew and that he would deliver uh, his people or the, the kind of some of the word that was spoken over him, however it was, he, he knew in this moment that when he saw something that he didn't like, there was something in him that was moved. And it said that he looked this way and that, and seeing no one, he struck down the Egyptian and he hid him in the sand. And so Moses sees this Egyptian that, uh, that is beating a Hebrew. He decides to take matters into his own hands. And he kills the Egyptian. And he looks around first to make sure nobody's around. He doesn't see anybody. So he, he does it. And then he buries him in the sand thinking that he's kind of got away with it. But then in verse 13, it says that uh, he went out the next day. And he saw two Hebrews that were struggling together. And he said to the man in the wrong, why did you strike your companion? The man answered and said, who made you a prince and a judge over us? Do you mean to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? Come on. Like, <laughs> he said, Moses was afraid. How many of you ever, no, not committed murder hopefully and got away with it, but how many of you have ever done something and in the moment that you realized you were caught, it was like, oh, it's not a good thing. <laughs> like, we got one who's really honest up here in the front. He's even going to raise his hand on it. Come on. Like that moment where you know you're caught. And you can imagine the panic because he's not just caught by something that he shouldn't have looked at on the internet, or he's not just caught in a lie or something. He's caught in the very act of murder, and it says that he was afraid, and surely he thought this thing is known. And then Pharaoh heard about it, and Pharaoh sought to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh, and he stayed in the land of Midian, and he sat down by a well. And so Moses runs from his life. He, he runs from the comfort of it, the palace and everything, uh, that he, he's been raised in a place of convenience and comfort because God had rescued him from a death sentence by Pharaoh's daughter bringing him into the home. He's been blessed. There's this convenience, but there's something on the inside of him that doesn't like what he sees. And he immediately begins to go in and he tries to handle things himself. Come on, any of you guilty of trying to uh, handle things yourself and it ends up turning out a little bit worse like, you, you, you've got a home repair that needs to be done, and you've got somebody who's supposed to come, and they're not coming on your time frame, so you just decide you're going to do it yourself, and you make it ten times worse than what it was before. We got anybody guilty of that type of thing? Here he was. He, he takes it into his own hands, and things become worse. Like, he goes from being a prince of Egypt who's growing up in comfort to a murderer who is running for his life. That, that the person that he was raised in the palace with now is seeking his life to kill him. And I think if we're honest in these things, we may not have been guilty of murdering somebody like physically and, and committing murder and hoping to get away with it. But I think many times we murder people with our tongues in the way that we talk about people. And we've got to realize that sometimes when we see things that we don't like... That, that, that when we rush in and we think that we're kind of uh, assisting God and playing Holy Spirit Junior and we're going to reveal everything and we're going to try to destroy everything and all that, we actually can end up causing more harm than good. And this wasn't an only story of somebody who felt like he was doing something on behalf of God. In the New Testament, you have the story of a man named Saul that many of us know will eventually be named Paul and 
And Saul was the same thing. He, he, he thought that he was doing God's work and he went out. And because these people who were known as, as the way were, were talking about Jesus and Jesus being the Messiah. And he didn't believe that that was the case. He, he uh, took matters into his own hands and, and he begins to murder and, and arrest these, these people that we would know later as Christians. And even in Acts chapter 7 you see that when Stephen is being stoned to death, that Saul is the one who gave the approval for, and, and gave the execution thing to, to have Stephen stoned to death. He thought he was doing the right thing. He thought he was punishing things. But later, Saul realizes that he wasn't fighting against people or Christians or, or some movement that was wrong. But he found himself fighting against God. Acts chapter 9, verse 1, it says that Saul was still breathing his threats. And he was still uh, uh, breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. And so he went to the high priest and he asked for letters to the synagogues at Damascus so that if he found any that were belonging to the way, uh, men or women, that he might bring them back bound to Jerusalem. And so Saul has taken this upon his responsibility to go and anybody that he feels is a heretic or is doing things wrong, that he's going to expose it and he's going to bring them in and he's going to either have them in prison or possibly even give the, the death sentence to them the same way that he did to Stephen. Verse 3 says that when he was on his way, he approached Damascus and suddenly there was a bright light from heaven that shone all around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Now I want you to notice something. This voice didn't say, why are you persecuting the way? Why are you persecuting these hypocrites? Why are you persecuting these Christians? Why are you per he could have used any other word, but he said, why are you persecuting me? And Saul answered and said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom you're persecuting. So here's Saul thinks he's doing the work of God, but he's attacking the body of Christ. And Jesus said, you didn't just attack my body, you attacked me. You persecuted me. And guys, this is why it's so important that even when we see things that we don't like in other people's lives and stuff, that we realize it's not our responsibility to try to change it. It's not our responsibility to be Holy Ghost Junior and try to get in there and fight. And we're going to be the heresy hunters and we're going to expose all of this stuff. God is able to move and take care of things himself. Paul should have known this because Paul was taught by a man, man named Gamaliel. And in Acts chapter 5, there's a person who is known as a Christian, and uh, they bring him before uh, the, the council, the Pharisee council, and, and the council is ready to kill this, this person. And, and in Acts chapter 5, verse 33, it says, when they heard this man, they, they were enraged. They wanted to kill him. But a Pharisee in the council named Gamaliel, he was a teacher of the law who was held in honor by all of the people he stood up. So this isn't just somebody. This is the one that when Paul is bragging about his credentials and stuff that he has uh, of being a Pharisee among all Pharisees and stuff, he said, I was trained under Gamaliel. This is that guy who was held in, in high honor and everything. And he stands up. And he gives the order for the men to be put outside for a little while so that he can talk to the council. And he said to them, men of Israel, take care about what you are going to do with these men. And he's warning them, don't, I know you want to kill them. I know you think this is the way you're supposed to do it. But you need to be careful about what you're doing right now. In verse 36 it says, for in the days of, of Theodos, uh, when he rose up, he was claiming to be somebody, and a number of men, about 400 people, joined him. And he was killed, and all of those who followed him were dispersed, and it came to nothing. And after him, Judas, the Galilean, stood up in the days of his census, and he drew away some people after him, but he too perished, and all of those who followed him were scattered. What's he saying? He's like, listen, if these people stand up and do something... God is able to take care of these things himself. And he goes on in verse 38 and he says, So in this case, in this present case, I tell you this, keep away from these men and leave them alone. For if this plan or this undertaking is of man, it 
will fail. But if this is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them, and you might even find yourself opposing God. And it said, in this time, they took the advice. Now, Saul, being as high up in the church as he was in the Pharise- among the Pharisees, he probably was hearing this. But Saul didn't like what Gamaliel said in this case. Because Saul felt like, this is my responsibility And he goes on and he continues to persecute Christians until he's literally knocked off his high horse, encounters a a bright light, and realizes that Jesus encountered him. You see, both these stories, Moses and Saul, they both thought they were doing the work of God. They thought they were on a mission from God. And and, and they were uh, accomplishing something. But God loved both of these men enough to have an encounter with them that would turn their life forever in the way that they would lead. We just read about Saul's, and now we're going to read about Moses. If you flip back in your Bible to Exodus chapter 3. Moses, this has been about 40 years. He's been on the backside of the wilderness. He's, he's married now to the priest of Midian's daughter, Zipporah, and he has kids and, and everything. And, and, and he's watching his father-in-law uh, sheep, and, and it says, now... Uh, Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, who was a priest of Midian. And he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness. And he came to Horeb, which is the mountain of God. And it says, and then the angel of the Lord. I want you to underline that phrase, the angel of the Lord. Anytime you see that in the Old Testament, that's an important phrase. We'll get to that here in a, in a minute. It said, it appeared to him in a flame uh, of a fire out of the midst of the bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not being burned. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see this, God called to him out of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here am I. Then he said, do not come near, take off the sandals off your feet. For the place that you are standing is holy ground. Verse 6 says, he said, I am the God of of your father. I am the God of Abraham. I am the God of Isaac. And I am the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face. And he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the afflictions of my people who are in Egypt. Now underline that phrase. These, These phrases are underlined because... When I was reading through these passages of Scripture, there were certain things that stood out, and I wanted to highlight them. It says, I have seen the afflictions of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, and I know their sufferings. And I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them out of this land into a good land and a broad land, a land that is flowing with milk and honey, the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites and any other ites that were in the place. There's a whole bunch of ites. So I've come to bring them out and deliver them. Verse 9 says, because the cry of the people has come up before me. And I have also seen their oppression, which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now, and I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. So when you look at this, I think it's very important that we realize that just because there was affliction, just because there were prayer, just because things didn't mean that things were automatically better the next day. And in fact, Moses had been delivered out of the water had been nursed and then brought into Pharaoh's house and then had been raised in Pharaoh's house. And then it says when he was grown up, then uh, he tries to take things into his own hands and then there's 40 years in the wilderness. Like even when he's getting ready to send Moses to go, this is an answer that was birthed like 60 years before it ever became manifested. We have to understand this, that, that God... Uh, uh, there's three phrases that, that I think were repeated in, in that passage of Scripture that we need to understand in our life. And the first one was this, is that God sees. It says, I have seen their affliction. 
I see the things that they're going through. The second one is that God hears. It says, I've heard their cries. Later it said, the cries of the people have come up before me. And I've heard the, the crying that they have. And the third thing is this, is that God knows. God sees, God hears, and God knows. And see, if we would understand that God sees and that God hears and then God knows, then we wouldn't be so quick to take things into our own hands and begin to make a mess of things. See, if, if Moses understood that, that that Egyptian who was being, that was beating the Hebrew, that God saw that, that God heard the cries of the man, and, and that God knew what was going on in that person. If he would have understood this, he wouldn't have been so quick to feel like, I've got to help God out, and I've got to go rescue this. If he would have understood that God knew so much about this, that 400 years before they're, they're in this. He tells Abraham, he says, listen, this land that you're seeing right now, I'm giving you this land. Your people will go away into Egypt and they will be prisoners for 400 years. And, but then I will raise up a deliverer and I will bring them here. See, God, God saw. God knew. Every bit of it, God already had a plan in place. And again, it did it didn't work out in the timing that, I mean, Abraham would have liked for, okay, God, instead of people going into oppression and struggle and everything, can we just kind of get this whole thing, let my kids be able to move here and not have to go through any of that stuff? Come on, that's the way we like it. We like it our way right away. But this ain't Burger King. <laughs> like, God is strong enough and great enough that he knows what's going on in the meantime, and if we can trust him. He sees, he hears, he knows. This isn't the only time that it's said in the book of Exodus. Right before this, we skipped over this passage, but we'll backtrack for a minute. In Exodus chapter 2, verse 23, it says, During those days the king of Egypt died, and the people of Egypt groaned because of their slavery, and they cried out for help. And their cry for rescue of slavery came up before God. He heard it. Verse 24 says, and he heard their groanings. I think this is one, if you have your Bible, you can underline this. And he remembered the covenant. What was the covenant? That these people will be brought into slavery, but I will bring them out and they will inherit the land that I promised. The covenant that he made with Abraham 400 years and with Isaac and with Jacob, that they would make them a mighty nation and that through them all the nations of the world would be blessed. And God saw the people of, of Israel, and God knew. Now, anytime you start seeing things that are repeated in Scripture, it's because the, the, the Holy Spirit is trying to get the point across. So here at the end of chapter 2, he says, God saw that, that God uh, knew, knows and, and that, that God hears. And then in chapter 3, again, it's throughout. And if you go read through chapters 3 and 4, you'll see those words. God heard, God saw, God knew, God heard, God saw, God knew. You'll see it repeated throughout that part of the book of Exodus. Why is that so important? Because we have to understand that if we take it into our own hands, we're going to make a mess out of it. But God sees, he hears, and he knows. And he wants to move. You go back to Exodus 3, 7. It says, and the Lord said, I have surely seen the afflictions. We've read this already, but I want to highlight another portion of it here in a second. I've seen the afflictions of my people who are in Egypt. I've heard their cries because of their taskmasters. I know their suffering. And I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians to bring them out of the land of Egypt to a good land and a broad land, a land that is flowing with milk and honey. When did God come down? Like, I haven't seen him in this, this thing, like physically God show up. But if you go back to verse 2, it says, The angel of the Lord appeared in the flame of a fire out of the midst of a bush. Anytime you see that phrase, the angel of the Lord, that's not just an angel. That's the angel talking about Jesus. This is a Christophany. So when it's saying that in the flame of the bush, in the, in the New Testament with Saul, there was a bright shining light, as bright as the noonday, and then Jesus revealed himself in that. Here in the Old Testament with Moses, 
There's a burning bush, and Jesus reveals himself. In verse 4, it says the Lord saw him, and, he, and he, uh, God called him out of the bush. And so you see God speaking to him. In verse 6, it says, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And he was afraid to look. What is this showing? It's showing that God moved on to the scene in the form of a burning bush to begin to speak to him. And he called him, not just to himself, but he said, I am coming to deliver my people. And he sent Moses to go deliver his people. Why am I bringing it? I think it's very important that we realize that both Moses and Saul's encounter was not for them. There's so many of us that we live... We think that every time we experience the presence of God, that that was just God's encounter with us for us. That we we think that when we come to church, uh, you know, we got to have church. And and that's when you go to the altar and you feel the presence of God and you start feeling goose pimples and and, and you start feeling excited and and, and all of this. And, And you have this encounter with God and many times we just think, well, God encountered me so that I could be encouraged, so that I could be uplifted, so that I could feel better in what I'm doing, but God didn't encounter Moses just for himself. God encountered Moses because he had a plan to send Moses to be a deliverer. God encountered Saul because he had a plan for Saul to become a deliverer. In fact, it says that when when Ananias was afraid to go pray for Saul because he's heard, he said, I've heard of this man. He's the one who's killing the church. God said, don't worry about it. I'm already showing him all the things that he's going to suffer from me because of the ministry that he has to do to the Gentiles. What's he saying? Ananias, don't worry about this. I already have it all planned out. I see it. I hear it. I know it. Just go. Just take the next step. Those encounters that we have with God, they're they're not for us just to feel good. They're for us to begin to do the work of the ministry. In verse 9, it says that he saw the the cries of the people, and they come to him, and, and he saw the oppression that the Egyptians were over. And then verse 10, he says, I have come. And, and I will send you to Pharaoh uh, to bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. I showed up for this purpose. I'm giving you this encounter for this purpose so that you can go and bring my people out. You see, in the Old Testament, man, God showed up to man in the form of a, of a burning bush. And he came to deliver his people in the New Testament. God came down in the form of a man in Jesus, and he sent him to man so that man would then go and deliver people again. John chapter 1, verse 14, it says, The word became flesh, and he came and he dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the Holy Son, the Father, who is full of grace and truth. See, Jesus came and he dwelt among us because he he wanted to transform us. If you go look at the the ministry and the things that Jesus did, he called people out of bondage. In fact, in Luke 4, he said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind the brokenhearted. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prisons to those that are bound and to declare the year of the Lord's favor. In other words, he, he sent me with the gospel So that I could help deliver people out of the bondages and afflictions and prisons that they're in. The picture that we see in Exodus is the very picture that we see with the Son of God in the New Testament. But see, a lot of us are like Moses. First thing that Moses said in in verse 11 after he said, I'm sending you, he's like, "Uh, but who am I? I can't do this. Who am I to go do this? Who... What, what do I even say if they ask me who sent me? And he says, tell them, I am sent you. And then he said, but, 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 but God, I, 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 I can't, I, I, got, um, I, I, God, I like, uh, but, uh, I'd like to, um, but, um, do you see, God, uh, I can't, uh, I can't speak. What's he doing? He's just continuing to, God, you've got the wrong person. And after God, I mean, God revealed himself in a burning bush on the backside of the wilderness. A lot of us would be like, well, if God would show up to me that way, I would go do exactly what he wanted me to do. (laughs) 
Really now. Really. We would like to think so, but we do the same thing. We bargain with God. But God, I, I'm, I'm an introvert, God. But, but, but God, my, my personality, I've taken these personality tests, God, and my, my personality just says that I'm not a people person. But, but God, like, I don't, I don't have a Bible college degree. I, I, can't, I can't speak. But God, I, I don't read well. I don't understand. Like, sometimes when I read, it, it's, it's like I'm reading in some foreign language. It's like it just doesn't come to me. And guess what? Every one of those excuses are excuses that I used with God. But God, I'm an introvert. In fact, I'm so introverted on every personality test that, like, I think they came up with a new category for me. But God, I can't speak. God, I can barely read. And you want me to read the Bible and then tell other people what it says. God, you you have to have the wrong guy. But no matter how much you negotiate with God, the Bible says in Romans that the gifts and callings of God are irrevocable. It's it's not going to change. Like, if God's calling you to do something... He's going to equip you to do something. And the very fact that you are not good at the thing that he asks you to do qualifies you to do it. Because it it creates a little bit of dependency upon him. And in that dependency, like, that's why every Sunday morning I come in here and I'm face down on this altar. God, don't let me mess this thing up. God, don't let me look like... Uh, like, I don't know what I'm talking about. God, help me to be able to, to, uh, to speak this. God, don't let me. Like, I'm, I'm like, it's dependency. And see, it's that humility that meets, that draws the grace of God. And that's why Paul, when he learned that, he said, you know what? I'm going to stop boasting about the things I'm good at, and I'm going to start boasting in my weaknesses. Because I realize that it's in my weaknesses that he's made strong. Some of you got to stop telling God what your weaknesses are and just say, okay, God, I know what my weaknesses are, but I know what, that you're strong. And I know that your strength can be made perfect in my weakness. And that's what God finally, after all of the different things of, of Moses trying to convince him that he had the wrong person and stuff, God just said, Moses, who made man's b- mouth? Who made his mouth? Um, you did? <laughs> If I made it, don't you think I can use it? Listen, the only ability you need to be used by God is your availability. Because if you're operating in your own ability, you're going to be like Moses, and you're going to be killing Egyptians and stuff, and you're going to end up on the backside of the wilderness running for your life. Or you're going to be like Saul and you're fighting against believers and everything and and you're, you're fighting against the very thing that Jesus died for and you think that you're doing the work of God. But God loved them enough to encounter them, to bring them out. When you look at when Jesus came in the flesh, Jesus came to... To begin to teach people and then send people. In Luke chapter 9, you know, he has his disciples in Luke chapter 9 verse 1. It says that he called those 12 disciples together and he gave them power and authority over all the demons to cure diseases and to to proclaim the the kingdom of God and to heal. It doesn't say that that, uh, like he used their gift. No, he gave them his. It was his power flowing through them. They made themselves available And they went from being fishermen to being people who would preach to the masses and thousands of people being saved in one day. To being people who would raise the dead. To being people who would open blind eyes. To being people who would cast out demons. To being people who would walk by crowds of people and their shadows were healing people. Ordinary fishermen who just made themselves available. In Luke 10, he brought in the thing and he sent 70 people out. And they go out in his power, and they come back, and they're like, oh, my goodness, Jesus, even the demons are subject to your name. Whose name? His name. They went in his authority. 
They went in his power. They went in his strength. And they cast out demons and they healed the sick. What does that mean? That whether it was a physical bondage or a spiritual bondage, because they made themselves available, the power of God met them where they were, and it brought people into freedom. And then before he ascends and goes back to the Father in Matthew 28, he speaks to the crowd again. And he says, Jesus said to them, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. So go therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach them to observe the things that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even until the end of the age. He's not saying all authority has been given to me, so good luck. No, he's saying, all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. And so now, I'll allow you to go in my authority. And in my authority, you'll be able to heal the sick, cast out demons. You'll bring deliverance in Mark chapter 16, verse 15. He said, go into the whole world, proclaim the gospel uh, to the whole creation. Whoever believes in him and is baptized will be saved. And whoever does not will be condemned. And these uh, uh, signs will accompany those who believe. They will cast out demons. They will speak in tongues. They will pick up serpents. They will, if they drink any deadly poison, it won't harm them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. And because you got crazy people who would say, well, God told me I have to pick up a serpent in the scripture. We throw out scriptures like these and we think that they're weird. But what Jesus is saying is you don't even have to worry about your protection. If a, if a snake bites you, you can shake that thing off into the fire like Paul did on the Isle of Malta. If somebody tries to poison you or whatever, it's not going to harm you. Why? Because you're under my power and under my protection. If I gave you the power to heal others, don't you think I could heal you if somebody had the boldness or ability to even try to afflict you? I've got you. I've got you covered. See, God came and he sent Moses out to do his work to bring people out of bondage and into the promised land. And Jesus came in order to teach his disciples that, so that his, teachers, his disciples could go out and make disciples and bring people out of bondage and into his kingdom and their promised land. And then he commissioned us to do the same thing. To go bring people out of darkness. Peter wrote this in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. He says, you are a, a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people that is set apart from my own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into the marvelous light. In other words, I, I didn't bring you out of darkness and into the marvelous light for no reason. Like our salvation is more than us being able to say we get to go to heaven one day and more than for us to get in a baptism one day and say, hey, I'm going to serve God. Our salvation, we were saved from something to bring other people out of something. We were saved from something for something. And we have to realize that if we have experienced the salvation the same way that the encounter with Moses was not about him, but the people that he would bring out, the same way that the encounter with Saul was not about him, but the people that he would bring out, we have to realize that the people that are crying out to God, needing God to move in their life, they are still people who are crying out to God and needing him to move. There are still people that God is looking down and sees the affliction that they're in. There are still people that God knows the suffering and the pain and the hurt and the obstacles that are against them. And he knows it. And he's looking around. Like, and, and Isaiah heard this and saw into heaven and heard this voice saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for me? And Isaiah responded with, Here I am, send me. We have got to begin to realize that the encounters and the blessings and the things that God has given us, that they're not for us to consume and to just hold on to. We've got too many toddler Christians today. Toddler has their toy and somebody else tries to grab their toy. That's mine. We do the same. That's my blessing. That's my money. That's my time. 
If I have time to give some of it to God, I'll give some of it to God, but it's mine. Now, you don't understand. Jesus, God sent his own son, his son, to pay the price so that we could become his. That's why he said, you're a, a, a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation set apart from my possession. In Corinthians, it says, we have been, we are not our own, but we have been bought by the price, by the blood of the Lamb of Jesus Christ. If we are still sitting and receiving blessings and holding on to them like they are ours, we are diminishing the power of the cross and the purpose of the cross. And we don't understand that there are still people who are in bondage that are crying out to God and that we have the answer to bring them into freedom. There are still people who are afflicted that we have the power of God inside of us available to bring healing to their afflictions. That God sees them, God hears them, God knows them. And God's desire is to send us the same way that he sent Moses, the same way that he sent Saul so that we can bring them out of darkness and into light, so that we can teach them and train them to do the very same thing in others. That's what Jesus died for. A church that's continually about the mission to seek and to save that which is lost, to see the needs of people, hear their cries, we begin to minister to them, not in our own strength. It's not about you or your ability. Your ability will mess the thing up. It's about your availability to him. The children of Israel, when they were led through the wilderness, the way that Moses led them through the wilderness was there was a cloud during the day and a fire at night. And it says when the cloud stayed, they stayed. When the cloud moved, they moved. So sometimes the cloud would be there for days. Sometimes it would be there for weeks or months. Other times it moved within a few hours. All they did was take the, oh, God's moving again, and they just fought, started taking the steps. They didn't choose their steps. They followed in the direction that he's got. Guys, all we have to do is make ourselves available. And God says do something, we take that step. God says stay, we stay. God says go, we start moving again. He's got to follow the cloud. God, follow the fire. I'm telling you, it comes from being in the Word of God. God's Word is a lamp unto your feet, a light unto your path. He'll lead you, direct you, and guide you through it. But we got to get in it and get it in us so that we can begin to speak it so that other people can find their freedom and find their healing.